So this week, Al has continued on with his experiments, and I went to look at this stuff. And I, you know, my my best thinking times when I'm laying in bed in the morning before I get up, and I was thinking, you know, it could be the GPS update rate, and it could be, um, say how fast the vehicle steers and how fast you're driving. So I had all these things going in my head. So I went and fired up my uh, fired up my computer and fired up the simulator and ran various experiments. So one experiment was I thought that if I were to um, modify, if I could break the simulator and make it act like the, the actual vehicles are doing, that would give me a clue as to what's happening here. So I went in there and thought, okay, I'll, I'll go in. And I think the first thing I did was I went in and, and slowed down the GPS update rate on the simulator. And on the, the simulator, I can do that. I can go into the URDF file and I can change the... Uh, there, there where it creates the fake GPS, one of the options is update rate. So you can change there. You can make it five hertz, 10 hertz, 20 hertz, whatever you want. So I, I just ran the experiment where I ran three different update rates because my vehicle, the one, I haven't done this for a while, but my vehicle here, this, this GPS receiver right there is publishing at a five hertz rate due to various things. I Theoretically, I should just be able to go in and change a parameter and say publish at eight hertz without changing anything. But I noticed the last time I tried that, things seemed to degrade, so I just left it at 5 hertz. And then I think they said if you turn off uh, two of the constellations, so if I turn off, say, Galileo and Beidou, and just leave on GPS and GLONASS, I think they say then you can set it to 10 hertz. And so I've got a, a path there. And somewhere it says, oh, by the way, if you turn off everything except GPS, you can run at a 20 hertz update rate. And so I don't know, you know, I have to see if I do that, how much my position degrades and then see if it uh, is resilient enough by by running that, if if I could run that at 20 hertz. So I, I do have some options there I could try. So anyway, but, but it was acting funny on, um, let's see, do I have the pictures here? No, not handy. Um, but what, what I take this vehicle out and drive it in the yard, it, it will, I, I had a couple times when it will actually try to follow the path, but it's got the real, it's, it does the oscillations that everybody's been complaining about here. And I thought, well, if I can get the simulator to do that, that would be a clue as to, you know, what's actually causing this. So I went through the simulator and said, run it at five hertz, run it at 10 hertz, and run it at 20 hertz. And sure enough, with the slower ones, it started to, I started to see the oscillations. If I set it down to five hertz update rate, which is what my real vehicle is, and I thought, well, that's interesting. And that's what I was going down the path. How could I speed up my update rates and all this kind of stuff? And the next thing I thought of was I, I kept thinking all along that the steering may not be fast enough. You know, if the, the path planner says, I want you to turn to this angle and then drive forward. And if it takes too long to get there, you know, it, it's going to confuse the thing. It's, it, it, expects it, it expects you to do what it tells you. And if you don't, you know, that's going to that's gonna confuse it and screw things up. So I, I ran some experiments on that. And uh, let's see, is that the one on Slack? I've got some pictures of that here. Let me back up and see if I do. You know, I'll just start at the top on Slack here and say, let's see, how do I get this now? I guess I share screen. Uh, screen one. Oops, these are my way again. Now here, let's let's do that. Let's say stop sharing that. Put this back in the way. Let's drag this over. I I hate it when they're taking up all the space on your screen. I can't I can't move. I can't get a hold of it. What if I grab it in the search box? No. So. <laughs> Uh, uh. On keyboard. There. If if I make my my stuff on the screen smaller, then I can get a spot at the top to drag it. So let's drag it over here, and then let's say share. Say screen two. Come on. Okay, now. Uh, 
Okay, so so I finally finally got it back to where I want to be here. Let's go back and start here. So in Slack, I posted this message saying, um, what was I doing here? Oh, I, I wanted to find out how fast, yeah, if I could have slowed my steering down in Gazebo, I wanted to know how fast it's running right now. So I came in here and I plotted my steering feedback. I've got that RC servo on there. Let's see, how do I do this? Like this. Okay, so here's my steering feedback, and it, it's just simply the, the pot on my RC servo. I feed that out to a, uh, um, I've got an Arduino Nano on there that just reads the voltage and just dumps that out to a file. And I normally don't use it for anything, but now it's real handy because I can say, if I go here, where it's, this is would be a full right uh, position, and this is a full left position. So I just wanted to find out from, from this point here, can, can you see my cursor? Yes, I can. Okay, so I went from this point here, which is around 32 seconds, and to this point here, which is around 35 seconds. So I thought, okay, in in three seconds, how many um, how many counts? Let's see, what was I doing? No, I also made the came to the conclusion this is uh, like like minus 0.4 radians, and up here is plus 0.4 radians, simply because I'm clipping the whatever it sends me, I'm clipping that to 0.4, just so I didn't smash anything. And just and that that might be part of my problem. Maybe if I open that up a little, mine it uh, behave a little better, because mine mine wants to steer plus and minus 0. 0.5, which is like plus and minus 30 degrees, is what my uh, my vehicle allows me to do. And I just artificially back that off to 0. 0.4. So I, I said, okay, if this is point this is minus 0. 0.4. This is plus 0. 0.4. See, these are these are weird numbers, but I just know. You know, in my head, I just equated that. So I, I took the total distance of 0.8 radians in three seconds. And then over here on the side, if I divide that out, uh, I get 0.266 radians per second on the steering. And then if you pull up the definition of the Ackerman message, it says down here under uh, steering angle velocity, blah, 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 quickly as possible. Somewhere it says this this number is in radians per second. So desired rate of change is radians per second for steering angle velocity. So I just thought, okay, that gives me a reference that I got 0.25 radians per second. And that was just an experiment I ran to figure out, to calculate that out. So let's see how to get out of here now. This one, this may kill it. No, it didn't kill it. So then I, I decided that if I go into my... Uh, my configuration file for pure pursuit. And I added this line on here, that's steering angle velocity. So that this is a parameter that gets loaded into the thing when you run. So I, I tried different values here, the 0.25 that I started with and a 0.5 and then a one uh, radian per second. So I could just change that. And the, I actually just change it in pure pursuit and that passes all the way through down to the Ackerman controller.py that's part of the, the simulator that we put together. And it it does honor that. So and the the way the way I know it honors it because if we go look at the next plots here, you can see what it does. So this this is if I set it to uh, uh, down here 0.25 radians per second. So this is approximately how fast the steering on my um, my real vehicle is. And it's, it's not it's not even making it. It's supposed to start down here at the lower right hand corner, and normally they come up and turn like this and drive up here to a point where the path starts and then it should drive the path and do the, the characteristic thing that we saw before. And it's just not making any attempt at that point. So so sure enough, I broke it very quickly by slowing down the steering and not letting it track like it's supposed to. Let's see, can I go to the next? I guess I have to close this one down. And then this is the next one at 0.5 radians per second. And it, see it, see again, it's trying to get to a, a starting point right here somewhere. And it, it, it's got a lot of oscillation getting up there. And they're just trying to drive the straight path. It's doing all kinds of stupid things out here. But it's, it's better than it was the first time. And then if I go one more and set it up to one radian per second, you can see we're getting the, the characteristic plot like it's supposed to be. So we're starting here. And it's, it's making the turn. It's still oscillating coming up to it. But it, it's actually following the path now. So that does tell me that, yes, if you get your steering reacts too slowly that it does indeed screw things up.
And then something that Al is going to talk about is that he went out and drove his vehicle at just a slower speed and everything got better. And so you've got the interaction there. You've got the, this thing requests, say, turn to this angle and expects you to do it. It expects it to immediately follow that. And if it doesn't, then that confuses it. So it turns out if you drive slower, it gives it longer, longer, uh, it gives it more time to get to the angle that's requesting. So by slowing the vehicle down, that's like increasing your steering rate. And so those two things seem to be interacting. And then back to my thing where I, I was talking about GPS. Let's see, did I, I, I think I, I talked about that, but I didn't show any plots because I don't have any handy. But as I would um, slow down the GPS rate, that would also make it worse. And so there, there, it seems like there's several things interacting here to get all the stuff to work. And the reason why slowing down the GPS, let's see, how do I get out of here? The, the reason why sl slowing down the GPS affects it is because the GPS publishes at whatever rate you tell it. So you go into your, your receiver and say, I want to publish at one hertz or five hertz or 10 hertz or 20 hertz, whatever it allows you to do. That's just how often it puts out the data. And then your GPS driver under ROS, you start that up and says, connect to the GPS. And every time it puts out a message, I'm going to publish this GPS fix and GPS velocity messages. And those are going to be at the same rate as the data coming in from the GPS. So that directly affects, by changing the number in the GPS, that affects how often it's going to publish to this GPS fix ROS topic. Now, we've got a program, uh, we've got various iterations of a program that it's called um, GPS to ODOM.py. And this is something that Matt came up with. And it basically subscribes to GPS fix and then takes your latitude and longitude and converts that to your XY offset. And it also, as a side effect, it takes in a heading from where, wherever you specify, and it takes that heading and that X, Y, and builds an odometry message to tell, and you publish that, and that says, that's where I am at in the world right now. So, so that's where Baselink is at in the world. So since this thing is triggered off the GPS message, if I have a five hertz rate, then five times a second, it's going to publish that odometry message. And then if you look at the pure pursuit stuff, it says subscribe to odometry. So every time an odometry message comes in, that kicks off one calculation cycle. So by changing the GPS to five hertz, that means pure pursuit is updating five times a second and publishing at five times a second. Or if you go in and set it to 10 hertz, then again, you're publishing odometry at 10 hertz. Pure pursuit runs at 10 hertz and you're putting out your steering angle at a 10 hertz rate. So that's why, that's why changing your GPS update rate affects this stuff. Because just in the code, in the pure pursuit code, it runs whenever this message comes in. So that's that's something there. So you just start slowing that down. You're not calculating as often, and it starts getting worse. And that's why I found that at five hertz, it's it's dropping off to the point where um, I, I could actually see it in in the simulator, but it was still running still running fairly well. Like like this picture down here. Um, See if this can work. Like this picture here, this this was as I'd slow down the the simulator to a five hertz rate, I started getting something that looked like this. And you know, usually if it's published at the standard ten hertz rate, this is a, a lot a lot smoother line here, and there's just just some slight oscillations as it moves up to this point. So that that's a, that's how I found out that the GPS does affect it, and I was able to do that in the simulator. So I was able to make the simulator worse by slowing down the GPS update rate. And then I, I went through this thing down here. I said, oh, well, but that still didn't explain why, you know, it works in the simulator, but does not work on my real vehicle. So I went down this path about, well, what if the steering speed is not responding as quickly as it expects it to? So then I ran this experiment to show the three different uh, effects on that. And then Al's got, got a plot. I, he'll probably show that, or I can pull it. It's right here, in fact. No, not that one. This one. Here, here's here's his effect when he's driving. When he's driving slow, it follows pretty well. When he's driving faster, then it's doing the oscillation. So so again, your forward speed is affecting this, and it all interacts in the fact that pure pursuit is updated at whatever rate your GPS is set at, and then as you drive forward, it's saying turn to this angle, and then your your steering speed. If your steering speed is too slow, that that confuses it, and that that's why it, it overshoots and 
and does this oscillation here. We'll zoom in on this. So, so it, you get you get this oscillation as the thing drives around, and then when he's he's running slower, then it it, it follows a lot closer to, to what the path should be. And what was what was the other thing? See, forward speed, GPS update rate, um, the steering speed. So, so all that. I, I made a comment. I, I made a whole list of things on. Look ahead distance also seems impacted. Yeah, that that would be another thing because it's telling it, you know, what, um, how sharp an angle does it have to turn at? The further you're looking out, the less of an angle it's going to have to turn. So then down here, I was I was just making comments, and of course you won't if you don't have access to Slack. Here, I'll, I'll let the, let this sit here a second so you can see what I was saying. But I, I was basically just saying that. Uh, somewhere here, I made the comment that those those things we just talked about are affecting the. Uh, I think in here somewhere I said something about that's what's affecting the, uh, the the way this thing's working. And then I said I was going to go look at the actual pure pursuit code, and I did that last night. It didn't didn't solve all the answers for me because the the way the the Larix pure pursuit code is working, it's it's using like Ross transforms to do things and the. The actual original paper was just saying, well, here geometrically, this is how you, you know, your vehicle's here. You got to create all these triangles, and it forms a circle to get to the point. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't get it through my head how that relates to what the lyrics pure pursuit code is doing. So that's kind of where I left that last night. And then, um, you know, so, so I was thinking. So as far as the GPS stuff, if if you can go into your GPS and speed it up, that's great. You know, I might be able to, with some playing around, I might be able to do that. I think Al's is set at 10 hertz, 10 hertz right now. I don't know if that's the fastest he can run it, but that's just, you know, I, I believe that's what he's running on his. And on mine, I've got the option of five or eight or 10 or 20 hertz, depending how much screwing around I want to do and then how well it performs once I make those settings. Now, as far as the steering um, on mine, I can I can go back to my, See, how do I stop sharing here? So on, again, on this vehicle back here, let me, let, me, let me make a bigger picture here. So on this vehicle back here, um, the well, on the steering up here, I've got a, a one of those giant RC servos, like, like, like one of these. This is this is what is controlling my steering, and you can you can buy these in two different two different flavors basically. This is this is actually let me get the right one here. I can tell the right one because it has the blue board on it. So I've got this one and it's got the blue board and it's got the, the pot on top here. And this one actually has a feedback pin. This this red connector here. If you pull that connector off and put wires on, I can get the, the position feedback out of it directly. And then uh, this one happens to be the, the B on it says this is the the what is it, ASTM 04B. And it's just like everything else it runs at 100. Oh, there's the numbers right there. Boy, if I had some new glasses on that. So it says, uh, that's not going to focus. Full volts. It says 180 kilograms per centimeter. And then I think if you look at the specs, it says it turns at 60 degrees per second. That's just the standard specs. In fact, that just a regular RC servo, they, they always quote it at like 60 degrees per second is how fast they run. Oh, here, I wrote it on right here, 04B. So my other one, which is I stuck on that little robot, I need to pull it off. That's a 04A. Now the A, will the it'll turn it like four times faster than this one will. And But you you give up some of the, the torque. I think it says those, I think they say they're 110 kilograms per centimeter as opposed to 180. So what I could do right now, I can go back to this thing right here. Put it up on a jack stand. There's one bolt that holds the front end on. I can pull out that bolt, and the whole front end drops out. I can just go in and I can pull that RC servo off and swap it out for the one that's the faster servo. So right there, I can speed up my servo by a factor of four. And then the question is, is my resulting torque at that point enough to make it to make it drive around? If it is, then I'll just leave it that way. But that'll give me the option of having a lot faster steering. And then if I want to, I can go in into the software and slow it down. Just 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 like the the, the Ackerman command specifies, that's what we're just looking at there. Um, let's see, view, go back to gallery, go back to share screen. Um, screen two. So back when I was talking about this right here, you look at the, uh, 
let's see, go here. So just as part of the, well, I don't have, I don't have the whole thing right there. If you pull up, just go to, say it's the Ackerman drive.html. If you just go to a, a command line and type in Ross Ackerman message, then it'll, it'll bring this up and tells you, you'll get the full thing here, but it's basically on the steering, you can set the angle and you can set the angle velocity. So how fast it turns back and forth, you could, you could adjust that. So in that Ackerman controller.py, they, they, are honoring that and they're looking at that value and say if you set a value other than uh, here they say if you somewhere here it says you put in a zero it turns as fast as it can and i notice on the configuration file it was putting in here i can, here I can get that how do i no it's it's not not there originally um I think it, it defaults, they put out 100. So it, it says turn at 100 radians per second, which is way too fast. So that just simply says, go as fast as you can. And the spec actually says you put in a zero, then it should turn as fast as it can. So anyway, I, I was able, I, I would then be able to, um, number one, put on the faster faster servo and drive it and see if it's see if it's too wild at that point. It may, it may, may turn too fast and oscillate or something. And if it does, then I can put in something to slow down the, uh, the, the turn rate, but that, that would be a way to speed up my steering. Now Al built his own, he's got a basically built his own RC servo out of a power steering motor. So he's got this giant motor on there and it's got way too much power. So he could probably get the turn really quick, but then you have to be careful. If you start experimenting, you're going to get to the point where it's going to get out of control and start smashing things. So that would be, you, you want to be careful about, you know, you've got the power there and you got the speed there, but don't don't just turn it loose because it may may start breaking things. So just experimenting, you may may cause some real damage by doing that. So, you know, don't don't just jump into it. Say you're going to fix that. Um, but anyway, that that's an option right there is make the steering uh, move, respond faster. And then you can control it by in the uh, the steering angle velocity up here. Uh, basically, you're just passing this number down to whatever your controller, you pass that down to your controller so you can have something in there that says, you know, limit how fast we're going to allow the thing to turn. So let's see, that was the, uh, so the GPS, you might be able to speed up your GPS, you might be able to speed up your steering mechanically, and then make that happy. Or what was the other thing, the forward velocity? Well, yeah, you can keep slowing it down to the point where it works. But as Al says right now, it's running too slow. He'd like to have it run run faster, you know, at least one meter per second. So what, what it comes down to, I think what it's going to come down to is that to keep Pure Pursuit happy, it would prefer to see a faster update rate, which again is controlled by the GPS. So what, what everybody in the Ross world says is, oh, you should run robot localization which is a package that takes an input. Uh, you, you can take an in, input from your IMU, your wheel odometry, your GPS, and various other sensors, and it fuses all that together with it with a Kalman filter. And I think, I think what it will do is if I have a GPS that's publishing at 10 hertz rate, and you got all these other inputs coming in, I think you can actually tell it to generate points faster than that. And I think it will actually create intermediate points in between um, and basically, it looks at your last GPS point, and then, let's see, do I need this open anymore? So you're driving along, and it says, here's a GPS point, and then a uh, tenth of a second later, here's a new GPS point. Tenth of a second later, here's a new point. So basically, what it does, the Kalman filter says, oh, well, you're moving at this rate. So it, so it, it generates intermediate points in between, I think, is what it will do. So that way... Uh, if you can figure out that robot localization, I think that might solve the problem here. You know, that's what everybody else said. Oh, you must run that. That's the way to do it. And I kept thinking, well, that's crazy. You know, my GPS is putting out this value at, at a high enough rate. Why would you need anything more higher resolution than that? Well, this this is pointing out that's why you need to have higher higher or faster update rates because the software doesn't the software doesn't want to uh, deal with what what with what we're giving it right now. So that might be a solution. Another, another quick hack you could do is say, um, in the program that's publishing the odometry, so you, you take in a GPS message, and then what you could do is, you, so again, you, you got this point here, and here was your previous point. You know what the slope of the line, the, ah, everything's backwards here again. You, you know what the slope of that line is, and then based on your forward velocity, you could just simply create your own points in between, 
and then just go ahead and publish extra extra points. So you could you could put say ten points in between the last one and the current one, and then the next one. You just just generate these extra points that that you're publishing out. That way you can run the thing instead of running it at uh, a ten hertz rate. You're going to now be putting out a hundred hertz rate to the pure pursuit. That should keep it. I, my theory is that'll keep it happier if you do that. Now I I don't know if 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 that will get around the problem of slow steering or not, but that's you know that that's something you you can play with. You could just do it. Assume it's going to be a straight straight line from where you are to where the next one is, and just move along that line. Now in reality, you're following curves. So what you, what you really should do is is instead of creating a straight line, you know, take your your current uh, steering value and figure out what that arc is, you know, just like this whole, that, that's what this pure pursuit is supposed to be doing anyways, figure out the arc to get to the point. So you just create points along that arc and then output those at the faster rate. So that, that that's somewhat of a hack. And it, it probably by the time, you know, you're here and you want to go to here, by the time you get there, it's probably, the points probably won't match, but in between you're going to get, uh, here, you're going to get points that are going to lead up to it and it may actually end up here or end up here, but so it'd be a little jump every time that you get a new GPS, but that that might be worth an experiment just to see if if just speeding that up makes enough of a difference to to figure out all the details on that or not. So that, that's kind of where I was at at the moment, thinking that, you know, without doing anything with the, the Lyrics Pure Pursuit code, without changing anything, you know, possibly just the faster update rate would solve a lot of these problems and that's just various things i thought of that may or may not fix the problem and that's that's but th i guess that's pretty much all i've done at this point so i i will make the comment that the more i play with that simulator and and realize you know i can make it do some really interesting things like you know the fact that i can change the gps update rate i can change the you know the steering speed of the stuff and this stuff all seems to to work and i go make the plots and the plots Sure enough, the plots follow along, and it it is a very valuable debug tool to do that. So that's that that that's all I got to say. I mean, on that last point, I I'm definitely impressed with um, how you can tweak the simulation to match you know the actual physics, because <laughs> yeah, that's always uh, really useful. Me, I'm just plucking around out in the yard. But. Well, let, let me make one more comment on that. Um, let's see, share screen, go back to Slack. Uh, so I had a plot back here that I put out. This one here. And this one, I kept thinking, why? Here, here the, the, blue, the blue line is the off path error. And the off path error is your your distance from your target point. Um, it, your your view your vehicle's down at the bottom, and so here's again I'll try this and get everything backwards. So your vehicle's down here, and your path you want to go to is up here. So the vehicle is projecting a a line of the center line of the vehicle as it sweeps back and forth like this. The off path error is how far it is between. Well, that's not doing any good, is it? Here, let me try. Stop sharing. Go to big view. Okay, I'll try this again. So your vehicle's here, and you want to drive to this point up here. So what you do, you project a line from your vehicle down here, your center line. Um, so the center line is sweeping back and forth across your target point up here. So the, the, however far this the the target point is from your your projected line, that's what they're calling off path error. I think by looking at the code, I think that's what they're doing. So it basically says that's how far off you are. And you could also look at the angle between the two. And when the angle is zero, that's that would be a good thing because it means you're pointed directly at it. So that's something else you could do there. Let's see, share screen. Let's go back to where it was. So that, that's what this blue line, this is saying, this is how far we are off from the point. And when you first start off with the vehicle pointed, I, my vehicle is pointed straight north and I have to go off to the west to get to the start point. So what it does, it says, oh, uh, I, I'm off by six six point two meters, which is actually correct. And again, this is you know just plotting out the files that tells me that. And so it says 
uh, from from the front of the vehicle to the starting point is 6.2 meters. And as soon as I say go down here, you can see my, at the bottom this is my velocity. So I'm just I think running from the joystick. So as soon as I start driving, you can see the vehicle starts driving forward. And the as the thing turns, the off path error, your, your vehicle is now pointed relatively at the point. As you drive forward, you're getting closer and closer and closer to the point here. And um, this this orange line is the the calculated steering angle. I kept I kept looking at this thing. Well, why here his look makes a really nice curve coming down here, but why does this these two follow exactly along here? They're tracking exactly the same point, and then you get this big overshoot. And it comes back as it comes back up. Then again, the the two are tracking on each other exactly. When I went in and you go into Plot Juggler and you say Edit Curve and you say Show me dots instead of lines, or you can say dots and lines. It turns out there's a sample point right there, and there's a sample point right there. So it's just simply drawing a line between those two points. So they're not, it's not that the calculations are making those two line up. It's just that with the slow sample rate, you get a you get a point like here and a point like here and a point like here and one up here. And it comes down here. You happen to get a sample right there. And so on so somewhere in between there, this thing actually uh the orange line actually sw uh, switched. And you don't know if it happened here or here or here or here. It's because the next sample points down here. So you got to be careful watching the plots because you know, the the plots are lying to you. or They're not lying to you. It's just that you are misinterpreting the things because you're not looking to see where the samples are. So that's something else that I noticed that if you turn on the, the ind individual points, and of course I don't have uh, a plot showing that, but that that's what was happening there, that there's simply a sample here and a sample there. So these things aren't really mathematically following each other. It's just simply that you had one here and one here. And somewhere in between that actually switched from, from full left steering to full right steering. And then if I have somewhere, I have a plot that has the, uh, I put the steering feedback on top of this. So you can see the, the steering feedback, as soon it gets right there and it, it's saying we're at full left. And then as soon as the switch is somewhere in here, then you can see the steering feedback will start. Um, let's say, it, let's see the steering feedback is here. It'll be some offset and it'll come down like this. And you can so there you can see the slope of the steering, and you can see the offset from when it started. So there's all kinds of other interesting things you can look at, and it it, uh, it, it again too bad I don't have the other computer fired up because I figured um, that this is actually a plot for my real vehicle right here. And then if I go over to the left under the menu, I can say plot the steering feedback, and I can put that right on top of this. And that was that um, that that purple line I just showed before when it's calculating the steering speed. So you can superimpose that on here and you can see that it's offset somewhere. And then you can see the actual angle of the steering. So you can see how fast the steering is moving. Oh, what's my point? Oh, so, so on the real vehicle, I can, I can get that. And I went to the simulator and thought, well, I don't have steering feedback available, but you can go into uh, all the, the, the values on the si the simulated data. And I can say, showing me my Ackerman, uh, steering angle request and then i can go over to the uh if you go out to the i think it's called the the left steering controller and the right steering controller and under that there's a section called data and you plot that and that actually is the steering feedback now you're, you're getting steering feedback for the left wheel and steering feedback for the right wheel and you can see they're offset due to the the whole ackerman concept of one wheel turns more than the other one so it turns out you can actually get the steering feedback out of gazebo also even even though it doesn't have a value somewhere in the code they're calculating that but i don't think that ever shows up i don't think it's ever published so i i just get the after effect that you, you say my the requested steering says turn it to a certain angle and then you can go look look at the left wheel and the right wheel which has all the the extra equations to make those the correct angle but you can actually see it on that too so by doing that, then if you're if you're playing with the steering speed, then you can see the the slope of those changes as it as it tries to uh, affect the steering on that. So that was another uh, again going back to the concept of the simulator and getting data out of the plots. That's that's just something else that I noticed and realized that's very handy to be able to uh, to do that. The the only the other thing on this particular plot that I made this purple line. This is the the heading of the vehicle. So you can see is the uh, if I had my steering angle on here, you'd see the steering starts changing here as it does. See, we're, we're turning this way. And when it gets to, uh, 
like the full right that it starts that the heading starts changing again so this is the actual oscillation of the vehicle as it drives around and this the the blue bluish blue green line aqua teal the teal line that that's showing you the how far it thinks you are you're off from the point as you're driving forward so it always confused me that you get this like a, a closed loop feedback here where you know it's saying we're off this far and your heading's coming like this. Now as soon as your heading starts changing, well that drastically starts affecting your 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 off path error again. So those two are working against each other. Uh the, the other thing I'll point out on this plot, this was an actual one for my vehicle and starting off, it starts here and comes down and has massive overshoot and it comes back. There's less overshoot and less overshoot. And then right in here you can see. If I had my dots on there, you can see the, where the samples are. So you can see these sample points um, are now. See, see the slope of the this slope of this one's almost straight up and down. The slope of this one's starting to change, starting to get more more of an angle to it. And you can see we've got more points in there. And the things are, it does look like it's following that. Now again, it might I might be misinterpreting that. Maybe it's not following it. It's just the way the samples are coming in. But I get less overshoot. And by the time I get out here, see the the slope of the steering is is slowing down to the point where we're getting more points in there. They're following each other, so that and it. Let me let me move my picture. I don't know if it'll show up on the recording or not. So once I get out here, and then then it's it's actually following. So the 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 off path error and the steering angle are, are following each other out here, so that you know once it calms down, it's it's the, the this jagged point. This is where it's going around a, a curve at the end. This is one curve. So this is the, the loop as it comes around and then comes back to the, the straight line here. I, and up here, this is telling me that I probably shut the thing down right here because the the yaw value just becomes constant. So probably, well, in fact, if we look right here where the yaw value becomes constant, look down here at the bottom of the speed. Say I, I back the speed off to, to zero. So it's basically just in a, uh, in a uh, constant condition. And then Again, my little icon might be in the way. Let's see, can I move this? Uh, any, anyway, uh, so the, the point I wanted to make is this does eventually calm down. And what I find odd is, if you look at this, it looks like the the off-path error and the steering feedback, once they lock together, they're right on top of each other, even though, even though they're supposed to be off by an arc tangent of something, arc tangent of the steering angle times two times something else. And it, it seems like those should not match, but they seem to. And that's that's another reason why I wanted to go through that Lurex Pure Pursuit code and go back through the original paper and figure out, you know, should those be different? Or it just seems like you know, if they're just following each other exactly, you could probably just take the off path error and just use that as an angle, stick it right into this thing and make it work. And I, I don't know if that gets around any problems of the update rates or not, but so that now, just one more thing I noticed as I was going through this stuff. So I'll stop there and I'll we'll turn it over to Al and see what he has to say. Ooh, I'm more out. That's <laughs> uh, so much. I'm glad we're recording this so you can go back and watch it. Um, let's see. Let's. Go to the mirror board for a second. So I'll make this bigger. Um, in my mirror board, I'm making it, I'm zooming out so you can see. It's down at the bottom, a bunch of examples. And that was the, sort of the biggest takeaway from last week was needed to do more testing and change variables. So, I mean, this is the fundamental test path. Um, in this particular one, I've got a thousand points. You see that 1049 step size is 0 0.1. So it's a very high resolution. I'll, I'll use that language. Um, series of waypoints. And I've got a screen print here and then some characteristics of, of the run. In this particular example, again, the step size is 0.1. The look ahead 
was two meters. I went back afterwards and sort of eyeballed, this is not a scientific analysis, but eyeballed the steer angle, both the, I've got the max and min there. So again, for me, positive is a left turn, negative is a right turn. And, you know, if you can look at, I would, after a few runs, it was pretty quick and easy to figure out whether I have a lot of waviness back and forth um, by looking at that min and max. Hold on a second, let me kill that fine. So this, and you can see the speed at which it was generally running. Now I don't have a pit on my speed control. I set the servo at a particular value, in this case 312, and it moves the hydrostatic transmission to a preset spots. But you can see, you know, in general terms, the oscillation that I'm getting. I mean, it's running, running the path, but it's based on that steer angle, which is also in the plot here. It's got some oscillation going on, more than I would want. And here's where, you know, I slowed it down, set the servo at a, at a slower rate. I get a correspondingly slow speed. Same look ahead, same step size. But quickly you can tell the max and min steer angles are much tighter, which Jeff alluded to earlier, a nice path without a lot of waviness. Um, so that was, you know, an aha moment. And um, the subsequent tests are, I bumped up the look ahead to two and a half meters. Uh, this was, th there's a video that I posted and um, this is data from another run that was yesterday that, you know, corresponded to just under 0.7 meters per second with a, a pretty decent straight line. Now, what you'll also notice is these, the, the turnarounds or the Dubin's path with a look ahead of two and a half meters instead of a reasonably tight curve, you get an, I'll call it an elongated turn. I'm not, I think the only, well, I mean, there's other than, in, in addition to the alternatives that Jeff alluded to around increasing the GPS speed. Uh, it's probably a way to have a different look ahead value on a straight versus a curve if we go back into the data set where all these waypoints are coming from in the first place. So I don't know. Um, certainly for testing, I'm just going to live with live with that. Uh, and this was bumping up the speed to close to a meter second. And you can see it becomes um, a little bit more wavy. What's interesting is this curve is not as, there's something going on with Interesting. The slower the speed, you get this shift left. You speed it up a little bit. The shift left is still there, but it, visually it doesn't look as bad. Uh, and then what was this test? This test was, oh, I was going to adjust the maximum rotational velocity, which is a variable in the YAML file, but then I looked at the pure pursuit code and it doesn't actually use that for anything. So um, yeah, that wasn't, that was uh, 
sort of where I ended that. And then, so just as a, just as a point, um, if, if you want to see it in the yard running, there's a video there. Um, I think I could live with 0.75 meters a second at the moment, but um, just to do testing, but that, as Jeff showed, was the, what the curve was looking like. So next steps for me, I wanted to, let's go to plot juggler. So I need to learn how to turn on those, how do I turn on the values? This is actual plot juggler, because I want to make a map. This is sort of one little flat area, and I was going to make uh, you know, a map that sort of looks like that, where it has, you know, smaller and smaller. Uh, the path gets smaller and smaller. And what do we call that? A coverage path? Anyway, um, do you recall, Jeff, can you come off mute and tell me where is the, how do I turn on the, what did, what did you call it? The, uh, show dots part oh, part. okay go back to your uh go back to your plot and uh do a right click and edit curves the top top button and then you can do either dots or lines and dots so first of all just do dots and look at it and you'll see that there's you can see what it looks like So if you zoom in on that, you should be able to see your individual individual points there. That also gives you an indication of how fast you're going to by, by looking at that. And what about the values? What do you mean values? See, it's not showing what my X and Y, I mean, visually I can see it's 15 on the X and 3.2 on the Y. I don't know of a way to do that in a scatter plot like that. Mm. It would be real handy, but I don't think I don't know that'll let you do that. I thought you had values up there. But... On mm. it on a, a regular plot, just a regular you know plot per time or plot for something, it it will it will show you the values, but I don't think you can get it on this. Well, mm. what, what's that? What's that icon at the top that's got plots and a one? Yeah, what what is that one doing? Change the amount. That's a change the amount of information display vertical time tracker. I, I I'm gonna see what it says. Displayed with a vertical time tracker. Again, that might only be valid for the other the other type of plot. Hmm. So um uh speaking speaking of value, if you need to know that value, you can see it over there on the left where you look at your uh yeah, you, you can see it right there. It says fourteen point seven two five and three point something. So that that'll give you the values, but I, I don't know how you can, you know, have them show up on on this particular type of plot. So for me, let's see, mirror board, video and image next steps. Um, yeah, the what I would create a. You know, it won't have very many lines because the yard's not that big, but create a map like that and run it and see, run it and see how it does at, you know, half a meter a second or something like that. And then I guess I could look at my GPS documentation too to see if I can go up to 20 hertz on that. I seem to recall I can. Um, see what see what good that does and then think about do I want to change the program to have a different look ahead for the curves versus the straights and how that would how we could implement that. 
Yeah, I think that's the whole point behind that. What do you call it? Adaptive peer pursuit or what, whatever they use in Ross too, whatever that term was. That's, that's, I think that's basically what that's doing is that, you know, it's deciding, you know, on a straightaway, it can use long, long uh, look aheads. And when you can detect a curve coming up, then you can, you can back that off and slow down to, you know, get the, get the closer look ahead and that way it'll follow your path closer. And I, I haven't actually looked at doing that, but I think that's, basically the the concept behind that and the comment about looking at your gps to see how fast it'll run that's that's totally dependent on the manufacturer you know what they're going to allow, allow you to do there so anybody that wants to do this you have to go pull up your your documentation and see you know what what see what they, they'll allow you to do and, and not do so so progress um more testing. So what I'll do, I'll, I'll upload your latest video to YouTube and then we can put a link to that. And for everybody that goes and watches that, watch watch as he comes around the end when he go, goes close to his little building sitting there. I could have sworn he was going to slam right into that building. You, you must no, not have much room between that. I left that in there. But you have to understand I ran like four tests yesterday. And yeah, I was holding my breath too. And and then today I'm like, I'm just going to let it run because it, it ran okay four times yesterday. But, you know, with the daggone GPS slipping around a little bit, I could have very easily smashed it. And I had a One thing you can do on that, make make your path shorter. So you, you got to, your two, still keep your two loops, put them, put them closer together. That way it'll just move it away from your building. You're right. When I was watching, I kept thinking about Matt's testing. He kept running into his house and running into trees or whatever. Well, what fun would that be? You could really screw up the steering on that thing if you do slam it into something. So you might want to keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> might want to be a little more cautious the way you are right now. I'll shorten the path. <clears throat> That's all I have for recording. Okay.